good afternoon to our participants and attendees of this webinar. As a uh, flash on the screen, uh, that is the title of the study that we are, will be presenting, Measuring Housing Affordability in the Philippines. And uh, an assessment of housing affordability um, is actually important as a starting point to understand the housing market as well as to craft in crafting policies to make housing affordable, inclusive, and resilient in the country. And there are several measures as uh, shown on the screen of housing affordability. On the, the left side of the screen are the scarcely used approaches and emerging novel approaches. This is ra rarely used because you it requires a more detailed uh, information and special surveys, which most countries do not have detailed on the housing uh, unit, that as well as not only on as well as details about the house the household. On the right hand side of the screen is the more is the conventional approaches, which are actually used uh, in uh, most inter, uh, countries. And this is composed of three components, the residual income method, the price income ratio, and the composite method, which is just a combination of uh, uh, the residual and uh, the peer. If you look at these measures, this, uh, the conventional measures are mainly um, uh, primarily relate income to the housing price. Although this can be a limitation, we also know that uh, a key factor, an important factor um, that uh, determines access to housing is actually uh, affordability. So there's a very high correlation between income and access to housing. And our research will be focusing mainly on uh, several uh, on affordability measures using the conventional approaches. Next slide, please. So the objectives of the study is first, we are to determine uh, whether the 30% of income standard captures housing affordability in the Philippines. And we all know that uh, for the, uh, what we are using now in the Philippines is actually the, the, the rule of thumb or a standard called the 30% of income standard, which is actually used in several countries. But is it actually uh, suitable in the case of the Philippines, or more importantly, does it capture housing affordability in the Philippines? The second is after we evaluate housing affordability, the country using other methods and suggest possible improvements in the measuring, in, in the measurement. And uh, lastly, we, we will be recommending knowing uh, the, the, the structure of our housing demand. We, we will recommend housing policy reforms that could make uh, housing affordable, inclusive, and resilient, especially in urban countries. So uh, we argue, next slide please, that the 30% uh, income standard that is currently being used as a measure of housing uh, affordability is not a suitable measure for in, in the Philippines because uh, this is mainly based actually on developed countries' experience. Actually, the 30%, as I mentioned, is a rule of thumb. And even during the post-war, the assumption is that if you can spend or pay housing, whether rent or amortization, that is equivalent to one week's wages, then uh, we, we say that housing is affordable. And later on, this was increased to 30% based on the experience of developed countries. There's a time series that looks into the, the income price ratio of 387, 67 metropolitan cities in nine developed countries. And apparently this is what, what are the standards that is uh, arising from that, uh, uh, from that data. So above 30%, that would be slightly um, unaffordable. And then you have moderately unaffordable housing if it's above 50%. The other reason is that uh, why we, we set this uh, argument is that um, in uh, developed countries, there is the low incidence of poverty and a significant proportion of middle income uh, uh, families, which is not the case in the Philippines, where you have uh, about 47% low income families and you have uh, about 20% uh, that's uh, vulnerable. Um, uh, low, also low-income, uh, vulnerable families, although they, 
they we consider them as middle income families. And this, the third reason is that uh, if you look at uh, the real wages over time in the Philippines, this is actually not, not rising. And whatever increases in wages that we experience is just enough to cover for inflationary uh, effects. So um, next slide, please. So I think uh, this is just showing you the, the proportion that I mentioned a while ago in terms of uh, the segmentation of, uh, of households based on income and uh, the classification of poor, low income, low middle income, uh, et cetera, is based on the study done by uh, uh, Dr. Alberts, also of PIDS, where he was able to classify um, the households into, into these categories instead of the, the decile, but it's actually related to, to the decile. So poor are those, of course, below the poverty threshold. The low income but not poor is twice, have incomes twice the, the poverty threshold, uh, lower middle income, four times the, the poverty threshold, and, and so on. So, so there is a, a, a factor that increases the, the income of household based on the poverty threshold. So uh, given that, I would like to turn over the the, the mic to my co-author uh, Tatum Ramos to pr present the results of the study. Tatum? Thank you, Ma'am Teng. Okay, so um, given the profiles that were presented by Dr. Balesteros, um, we were interested in knowing the percentages of income that's allotted to housing expenditure. If you look at the third column of this table, you will notice that uh, the, the percentages are around 10%. And that would give an impression that housing in the Philippines was affordable back in 2018. However, we, we knew that we had to make additional verifications on this. So first, we, 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 we tried getting the 30% standard housing expenditure. And from that, and also income, we were able to generate the annual receivable income based on the 30% standard. So this is also the, the income that is left to be allotted or can be allotted still to non-housing basic expenditure. We then compared the values with those of the threshold or the minimum non-housing basic expenditure, which includes food and non-food um, items. All right, so um, in the last column of this table, you will notice that the poor and the low income but not poor uh, seem to be vulnerable to housing stress. This is because their annual receivable incomes uh, fall below or a little just above the, the threshold or the minimum non-housing basic expenditure. We also adopted this measure called um, Housing Affordability Index or the HAI, which is usually defined as the ratio of median family income to the qualifying income that's required to make payment for a median priced house. And a value of 100 for the HAI or the Housing Affordability Index means that the median income family has sufficient income to purchase a median priced house. And we, we tried getting the estimates for um, selected areas based on available data. So, you will notice that on the table, the values of the HAR, HAI are below 100. And this um, would reflect that a typical family in the, in, in, in the particular areas were not able to afford housing that's being supplied in the market back in 2018. Now, if we look at the trend of HAI in the Philippines based on government price ceilings, you will notice that um, a typical family in the Philippines would not be, would rather, they would be able to afford socialized housing, but would not be able to afford economic housing. And this is important, particularly because we would expect um, typical families to be able to afford these economic housing that's priced at the, at the ceilings because these housings are particularly or should be particularly particularly catering to these families. 
We were also able to compile information from the NHA, Shafsi, and DSUD. And um, we, we came up with this map that um, shows the distances of low-cost housing projects to the nearest urban centers in Metro Manila. And we find that um, many of the projects were actually quite far from the, from the city centers or the nearest urban centers in Metro Manila. And this ha would have, of course, implications on transportation costs, and because especially if if families or family members are working within um, the the urban centers or or within the city centers. I, also, um, transportation costs um, would need to be considered when we're talking about housing affordability. Now, if we look at um, this particular data that's um, based from uh, that that was taken from the Global Property Guide, and the data was also featured by Behind Asia in 2022, and this shows us the house price to income ratio in the Philippines versus neighboring countries, some of the neighboring countries in Asia. And if you look at the figure, you will notice that the Philippines is actually one of the top countries that. Are, that have were in housing was an affordable or is an affordable. And given all those um, initial insights, our team wanted specifically to determine the affordable housing packages in the Philippines. And we used um, the residual income method um, to be able to generate this. Uh, we use this method because this measure this measures housing affordability based on factors including non-housing expenditure and sufficiency of income after housing expenditure. Under this method, housing is considered affordable if household income minus housing expenditure is greater than or equal a minimum non-housing expenditure. The method also provides insights on extent of housing stress or shelter poverty. Housing stress is experienced if household income minus housing expenditure minus minimum non-housing expenditure is less than zero. In other words, the stress is experienced if the income of um, the household is not sufficient to cover for basic expenditures. So what are the components of that minimum non-housing basic expenditure? We've listed down these items on, uh, on the table on the left-hand side of the screen. And these items were based on PSA's total basic expenditure items. So just to run through this, we have food expenditure based on food threshold and family size, expenditures on clothing, footwear, and other wear, water supply, and miscellaneous services relating to the dwelling, electricity, gas, and other fuels, medical care, education, transportation, communication, non-durable furnishings, and personal care and effects. We were also, um, we were able to generate the thresholds for non-housing basic expenditures. And again, these food thresholds were, the food thresholds used were based on PSA, PSA estimates. Um, and we also considered family sizes. And for the non-food threshold that's based on the average expenditures in the, fir in the first to fifth income decels, which are assumed to be the poor and the low income, but not poor. All right, um, if, if you look at the table on the right, you will notice that the thresholds vary according to the areas. So for example, um, Metro Manila or the urban areas of Pambanga have the highest values. And also for, um, uh, in terms of family types, these thresholds also vary. So those with um, family size of two have lower thresholds than those of family size of five with three children. When we adopt or, or, or take into consideration those thresholds, we are able to um, estimate or gauge the extent of shelter poverty based on socialized housing price ceiling. So this table um, on, on the Philippines and urban areas in the Philippines 
they tell us that the poor have negative residual incomes after housing expenditure and thresholds for non-housing basic expenditure are subtracted from the income. So in other words, this just tells us that the poor were experiencing housing stress when it comes to socialized housing that were priced at the ceilings in at the ceiling in 2018. And also the vulnerability um, covers even the low income but not poor when it comes to economic housing priced at the ceiling in 2018. Now, um, when we compare um, the residual income method and the 30% standard, we notice that for uh, the 30% standard underestimates the percentage of families under socialized housing stress in 2018. So just to illustrate further, um, in, in urban areas in the Philippines, the 30% standard tells us that 8% of, of the families back then were experiencing socialized housing stress. While um, for the residual income method, it tells us that 21% of the families were under housing stress. For economic housing, um, the 30% standard overestimates the percentage of families under housing stress. But it is still important to note that um, the values or the percentages are quite large. Um, for example, in the Philippines, 56, under their residual income method, 56% of the families were under economic housing stress in 2018. Now, we also considered um, the, the lifestyles of, of the families within the income groups. And in this table, you will see the affordability ratios based on the mean, not, mean annual non-housing expenditures in 2018. You will notice that the poor do not have any income that can, do not have sufficient income that can be allotted to housing. But when you look at the low income but not poor, they are able, they were able to meet the 30% standard. However, as you go across the other income groups, you will notice also that the, val the, uh, the values of the affordability ratio vary. So um, this just implies that the 30% standard is not applicable in the Philippines. But what is, what is more important to look at actually is are the affordable housing packages and it's also important to compare those with the price ceilings during that period. So in this table, we are showing you the affordable housing packages based on the mean annual non-housing basic expenditure in 2018. Uh, again, the poor do, uh, cannot afford any housing package while the low income but not poor and the lower middle income were not would not be able to afford housing that was that were priced at the ceilings um economic housing priced at the ceilings which i think around uh, in 2018 was around um 1.7 million now what can we derive from these um findings first is that the extent of housing stress um tells us that housing is has not been affordable in the philippines um, and also the 30% the standard um, is not a suitable method to, to generate or to determine housing affordability in the country because it overestimates um, uh, housing affordability among the poor while it underestimates the affordability among higher income groups. Also, the, the residual income method um, is able to give us a more accurate or can provide us a more accurate picture of housing affordability given affordable housing packages um, and also given comparisons with the price ceilings. So to further conclude um, this presentation and to provide recommendations of the study, we I, I give the floor to Dr. Basteras. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Taitung. Please uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, so given what we know about uh, 
uh, affordability levels in the Philippines, as well as the apparent mismatch between uh, housing afford affordability, households affordability, and what is available, what is supplied in the formal market, we, we uh, recommend a certain uh, what you call enabling uh, policies and rules that will uh, hope to improve uh, the functioning of the housing market. And uh, these reforms are actually pro providing and enabling governance as well as a legal framework that uh, would uh, set the tone for housing programs and housing interventions in, in the country. The first is uh, a government, we, we think, we, we suggest that in the case of the poor and, and for socialized housing or affordable housing development, the government plays a very important role. In fact, if you look at the, the history of other countries, when the country is still at, at the sta early stages of development, and I think in the case of the Philippines, although we are emerging, if we look at uh, developments of household, we are still at the, uh, at, uh, at the low level or the early stages, uh, there is, you move towards non-market solutions in addressing uh, of um, the housing uh, needs of the poor and the, the low-income households. So uh, yeah, given that, the government should uh, provide, uh, needs to create a public housing fund. It's really earmarked for housing. And this is not only at the national level, but also at the local level. And this can be used to uh, support um, uh, provision of, uh, of housing, uh, this is this either to a slum upgrading or provision of public house rental housing. Um, it can also be used to, to, to fund uh, subsidies, direct subsidies. And as we have been repeatedly saying, uh, subsidies should be well targeted and it's not open, uh, that in which the access to housing will not really be the middle income, but really those who are in need. The other, uh, I think, important consideration for government's role in the housing market is to really create a land community trust. This is actually separating land, um, a self-containment of certain um, land, um, government lands that can be used uh, for um, for the development of affordability, affordable housing, and can actually be passed on to, uh, to new sets or new households that would need it. Because we know that um, households, there will be improvement in income over time of households. And probably uh, if you are uh, low income at this, at, at this time, you will, in the future, you can afford housing in the market. And therefore you, you'll be able to instead of you keeping the asset that has been uh, provided by through government subsidy, then uh, we can, this can be uh, sold, this can be uh, uh, allocated to a more deserving or underserved household. So the way to do it is actually through a land community trust. You separate actually land from the building itself. In some countries, they can even buy, uh, own the building, but you can only sell it to the uh, to the uh, land whoever is involved uh, uh, to to government or whoever is managing the land trust, or it can be in the form of of rental. So uh, I think that's very important in the case of uh, to have affordable housing and to retain that in even in urban areas. Uh, the other one is, which is also related to government uh, a role, is the development of your rental rental housing. And I think this has been uh, already em uh, emphasized in several uh, studies and discussion. And it's a good thing that uh, that uh, the House Committee at the Senate and Legislative uh, um, Senate and Congress 
have already come up with this rental housing voucher, which is one policy that can be, uh, that actually supports rental housing in the country. But I think uh, it should be, it should go beyond that. Uh, there should be, it should be well thought of, and there should be uh, complementary uh, policies to be able to support that. And uh, again, review of the of the rent control is uh, is uh, needed at this time. Uh, although we are saying that the rent control now is is less restrictive as in the in the past. The, the recent literature is showing that even with uh, this uh, less restrictive rent control, uh, the control on prices is not uh, helping helping uh, the development of the sector. Especially now, if you're going to have a, a rental voucher, actually, the object, one of the object, intended objective of that is to increase investment of the private sector in rental housing, which can be actually hindered by the presence of your rent control. Then there, there could be other ways of incentivizing uh, rental housing development by, by the private sector, especially if we uh, public rental housing seems to, we have tried that in the past, but uh, because of problems of, in terms of management, uh, this is not, uh, uh, this has really actually deteriorated uh, into, your housing stock actually has deteriorated. Uh, next, please. Okay, the other uh, priority reforms has to do with the supply side of housing. And this is pursuing land uh, related reforms. And the objective really of this is that you will avoid or hinder over -commer commercialization of your housing sector. So to government should ensure provide controls that would uh, lead to speculative housing, uh, speculative increases of prices in housing, as well as what you say, as we call it, over-commercialization of the housing sector. And this can, can be done. One, I think, of the legislative agenda that we have on uh, in, in Congress is the uh, implementation of a standard valuation for real estate properties. Yeah, the effective implementation of idle land tax, which is already actually a law, but the implementation has to be uh, addressed. <laughs> and um, improvements in terms of ease of doing business, as well as titling, as well as building permits and licensing. The other ref uh, um, important reform would be uh, the provision of innovative housing finance for households that but, and, but uh, government should ensure that this will not distort private market incentives. Uh, we should come up with tools that will mitigate the risk of market defaults that is related, often related to interest rate volatility. And the last one, which is actually in, still being studied is to pursue construction reforms. And we have to look into more details into the construction industry, the supply side uh, value chain, from infrastructure development, the, 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 the provision of basic infrastructure, to construction, uh, to building operations, and to maintenance. So is there a way that we can have a more efficient system so that uh, we can um, uh, more or less control or uh, we have a more efficient system to enable uh, more affordable housing, whether this is for the, the low income group or for the middle or uh, income uh, market. So I think that ends our presentation. Thank you for your attention.